And this session is particularly interesting. It's on AI, deepfake, and disinformation landscape. I've been, <laughs> I've been a victim of late. You know, people put my video with Dangote, saying I was saying that Dangote has introduced a scheme that you don't have to work anymore in your life. At some point, I almost believed, like, oh, that was, did I, that was me. It sounds like me. It looks like me. It's obviously me, but obviously it wasn't me. But a lot of people believed it. They used me to sell hypertension drugs. They used me to sell other drugs that I cannot mention here because it's Children's Day. So this is one you want to pay attention to. And the moderator for that panel is, oh, some of us are getting that joke, right? The moderator for that panel is Program Manager Africa Witness, Inkem Akonam Agonwa. Let's put our hands together for Inkem Akonam Agonwa. She's a lady in pink. I hope I got that right. I'm always missing my call. Let's click clapping as she steps on stage. Inkem Akonam Agonwa, Program Manager, Africa Witness. Over to you now, Inkem. Thanks so much. You got it a little bit. It's Inkem Akonam, but Inkem is fine. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Inkemakonam Africa, Inkemakonam Agunwa, and I lead the Africa program at Witness. And good morning, good evening to those who are joining us virtually from across the world. Um, first off, I really would want to commend CJID and its partners for putting together such a timely event. Conversations around artificial intelligence, deep fakes, they're happening globally and they're happening continuously. And a number of us have continued to advocate that we must include global majority perspectives in these conversations. And what we're doing today is a typical example, actually a very good demonstration of how not to ask for a seat at the table but to actually make your own table. So really, a round of applause to CJID for this. So the conversation today on AI, deepfakes, disinformation, and democracy is such an interesting conversation. 2024 has been described as the Super Bowl of elections. Over 40 countries are going to the poll today, this year. Actually, over 2 billion voters have either gone to the poll or are set to go out to vote. So it's really a significant year for democracy in the world, including in Africa. There are 19 countries that, at least 19 countries that are going to the polls, including Ghana, Senegal, South Africa, and these are significant democracies. And today on this panel, we're going to discuss the impact of AI, the impact of deepfakes on democracies, on elections. We have already seen how deepfakes have impacted on civic debates in, in some of these countries, have also impacted on the election processes and perhaps the election outcome. So this is the most talking I'm going to do on this panel, and I would really love to introduce the panelists. Um, I will start with Silas Jonathan, and Silas is the research manager, Digital Technology, AI, and Disinformation Analysis Center at the Center for Journalism, Innovation, and Development. Hello, Silas. Keep going, keep going. And we would have Monsu Hussein, who is the head of innovation at CJID. We would also have joining us Adejumon Shoinka, Africa editor, The Conversation. And finally, joining us virtually is Hannah. Ajakaye, the founding director, Fact Matter NG. Can we have her up on screen if she's with us? Okay, so in two minutes she will join us. So hello, great to have 
Oh my God, I'm the only female teacher <laughs> with you. Okay, so blessed am I amongst all men. And hopefully we'll have a really, yeah, Hannah is virtual. But... <laughs> so I hope we have a really vibrant conversation this, this afternoon. So I will start with you, Monsoor, because you were up here and you really gave a very good demonstration of the two um, tools that CGID has developed. And I really must commend the novelty of the audio tool. And I really want to give you an opportunity. Hello, Hannah. Thank you so much for joining us. We can see you on screen. It's quite early, but thank you for making the time. All right. So I really would want to give you an opportunity, Monsieur, to give us uh, in two minutes, or maybe I'll be generous and give you three minutes to give a, a, a more in-depth demonstration of the audio tool that Dubawa has developed. Uh, so I think I sent a video to the comms, and um, they're just going to play that in a minute. So basically, um, the platform works in, it gets audio in three different ways. The first <laughs> one is, so, okay, the first one is the, um, the, via the radio shows, second is on YouTube, and third is by uploading by yourself. So if you just watch this, you'll get the idea here. So you basically have to sign up on the platform. Then your whole verification process is done. After that, you just log in. So uh, here's a, your dashboard, and the first feature is to um, upload an audio file. And we support three languages, three of them listed here. Then you upload the audio file. So this is on dubawa.ai, by the way, if you want to check it out right now. Dubawa.ai. And then uh, once you upload, then the status is in progress on your dashboard. And once it's completed, the transcription takes, depending on the size of the file you've uploaded, will depend um, how long it takes. So here's a transcription of Pigeon, actually, from Bracket there. This is also a sample claim. So here is a sample claim from State Affairs. Uh, and then to schedule a radio show, which I believe is the most interesting part, really. You know, basically holding people accountable for what they propagate to millions of people. So the first step is just to you add the show, provide the times that it works, uh, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, whenever it is. And then there's a manual verification process after that, because we need to ensure that you know, you're not just trying to record 24 hours audio, so that takes a lot of bandwidth. So we need to do the manual review. And once that is done, that's, that's just it. You get to see your, your files on your dashboard, as simple as that. Awesome. A round of applause, please. Thank for you. Making that seem so easy. And I would just have a quick follow-up question, more so to that, and just a caveat. It is a loaded question. Why? I think it's a question that is right at the tip of a number of people here. Um, and, and this is not just to the audio tool, the audio tool as well as the chatbot. How do you deal with language accessibility? I saw that we have it in Pigeon English, which is great. But like we all know, there are a number of languages, and people communicate in those languages, including through audio. How do you deal with language accessibility? And how do you deal with bias and over-representation, given that the claims are verified using real-time online data? So that's the one part of the question. Like I said, it's loaded. And then the second part is, how do you make obvious to the users the limitation of these tools? Okay, so um, that's a lot of questions. Yeah. 
So on the first one, regarding the language limitations, so we, we saw that, and you would see that we differentiated Nigerian English, Ghanaian English, Nigerian Pidgin, because mm -hmm. all of these are actually different to a machine. Amazing. So you might think English is English, but it's, it's really not. And the way we speak is quite different. So we add a lot of manual transcription done on Nigerian English accents, which we use to train a model. The same thing for Pidgin. So we had a lot of manual transcription done to now um, improve on the model. And that is still ongoing as we move forward. So it's, it's a lot of effort. And right now, we are looking at partnerships with academic institutions. So they have you know, the students to gather a lot of data and then um, how we can work on the data to improve the natural language process uh, with um, Nigerian and African languages as a whole. So it's, it's really work in progress, and there's no 100% accuracy. But we've done a, a big job on you know, fine tuning with our own manually transcribed data to improve the output of the models. Um, so next, on your second question, because it's speaking real-time internet information, how do we handle bias and all of that? So basically, we are not pulling from the open web. We are only pulling from our own list of verified sources. So um, let me give you an example. We, have, um, we believe that the fact check organizations in Nigeria are actually reliable, because that is the work they do. They provide fact checked information. So if you're looking for a claim that relates to a national issue like that, it pulls from this source. And it is not going to pull from maybe an Insta blog or a random person's tweets or things like that. So that is not among the data that it is using. So instead of it giving you data from an unreliable source, it will tell you that we don't have any information on this. Or I have no evidence on whether this is true or false. And then you, know, like, you, know, you basically know that a fact check has not been done. So now what we are doing is we are noting it down, everything that you ask. And if we find an interesting pattern on what you've asked, maybe several other people have asked the same thing, then the Dubawa team is notified, and they do the actual fact-checking on that issue. Um, the last question, I don't, I'm not sure what it was again. No, I think you've touched on that, because okay. I spoke about okay. the limitations. Sorry, I, I really think that you have covered it. Thanks so much. Thank I'd you. want to move to Silas. Um, Silas, there's a lot of conversation around the use of open source intelligence as a tactic to confronting the challenges of disinformation, including deep fakes. How do you think that OSINT as a tactic has fared in terms of countering disinformation aided through AI manipulated media or what people know as deep fake? Well, uh, thank you very much for this good question. It's a pleasure to be here. I feel like a politician sitting here and just looking down. Maybe I should contest for, yeah, but uh, back to the question, how is OSINT? And OSINT, by the way, is simply open source intelligence. You know, uh, how is it helping to solve the problem of deepfakes in terms of um, mis- and disinformation? Uh, it does that in three ways. It tries to answer the question of who, it tries to answer the question of why, and it also tries to answer the question of how. So who? Most times um, uh, when the issue of deepfake comes up, and what is deepfake, by the way? You know, I don't want to make the assumption that we all know what deepfake is. Uh, deepfake are synthetic videos or audios that is created using um, AI, uh, with the specific aim of uh, impersonation. So it has the face and voice of someone, but it's not the person because the creation was entirely done using artificial intelligence. Uh, why it is in the uh, discourse of disinformation, it is because now people are using it to tie narratives to popular people, politicians, and then you make the assumption that that's the person, uh, but in reality, it's not the person. So, so that is the issue of deepfake. But then how is OSINT? 
responding to this. So in terms of who, it, when OSINT, uh, in the practice of OSINT in dealing with deepfake, one of the things that comes to play is not just to verify whether the deepfake is, is, um, is, is not just to justify whether the deepfake is true or not, or if it's real or fake. The focus is not there first. The focus is who is sharing the deepfake. Because sometimes uh, technology is in itself, uh, it's not harmful. It is who is now using it and for what purpose. And that's, what the, that's where the what comes to play. For what purpose and who is sharing it. Uh, deepfakes are like tool. Uh, uh, and then how it is used usually suits the ideology of who is sharing it. And where I have seen it play uh, a lot is um, uh, political, inter-political party, you know, trying to rival each other, and then deepfake comes to play. So uh, we use OSINT, uh, open source intelligence, to first of all identify who is sharing it so we can understand the context of the narrative. And then secondly, why? Why? The why is important because it explains the intention so uh, is the person sharing it because he wants to decimate uh, his opponent in, 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 in elections? Is the person sharing it because he wants to mislead people to buy certain drugs? You know, so if the intention comes to play, the last thing is to now verify whether the video itself is a deep fake or not. And then, um, uh, as you know, there are lots of OSIN tools uh, for that verification, but I will, I will talk more on that uh, subsequently. So, but the direct answer to how OSINT responds to uh, deepfake is by clearly responding to the who, the why, and the what. Thank you, here. Thanks so much, Silas. And I'm sure you'd agree with me that the use of OSINT as a tactic is one that we have to demo democratize access to that skill set. Because right now, it is really a skill set that is a bit far removed from the reach of those who really need them the most. And I'm going to come to you, Hannah. It's so lovely to see you. I remember when we first met in 2021 um, at a convening on misinformation and disinformation, and we touched on deepfake. And we really identified at that time that though it doesn't seem like it's a threat at this time, but there is the coming storm of it. And it almost feels like we're in the eye of the storm right now. And you've gone on to do so many incredible work around combating disinformation as well as deepfake. Can you share with us specific instances where Fact Matter NG successfully debunked deepfakes during democratic transitions? Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Clearly. Okay, thank you so much to CJID for convening this important meeting at this point. So I would like to just talk a little bit about what Fact Matter did during the 2023 election, the last general election that we had in the country, where we collaborated with fact-checking organizations and the Nigerian Fact Checkers Coalition, the entire body. We don't produce fact check. So what we do is to repurpose fact checks that are produced by the media organization that we partner with. Because what we do is to work towards engaging the audience for fact checking content, ensuring that fact checks are easily accessible in appealing contents that people can easily digest. So I remember the deep fake debunk that we did, that we repurposed for the cable, and that was the viral audio of Atiku and Tamboa and Okoa plotting to rig election. I'm sure many people would remember that because at the time when it was produced, it was like 24 hours to the election. And if you look at the trends of the discussion on Twitter, like a lot of people actually believed that it was real. Like I saw a comment about an IT person who was like, oh, I'm an IT person and this is not fake. So it was like one of the prominent cases. And the other ones that we work on with are to repurpose with our media partners include, you know, the claim about Hollywood actors supporting Peter Obi, displaying cards for support with Peter Obi. That was actually published by Dubawa, I remember correctly. And again, there's the another instance of Elon Musk declaring support for 
Peter will be as well, as well as another one of Donald Trump. So those are instances of the deep fake that we kind of repurpose with, uh, we repurpose those content with our partners and we created videos, short social media videos that are easily shared on social media so that people can get education on that. And the other thing that we did is to kind of work on media literacy content where we engage content producers to kind of produce media literacy content, teaching people how to spot deepfake disinformation. And also and another one talking about, we also translated those into local languages like AUSA and Yoruba and Pidgin. So that way we are not leaving out those that usually do not consume information in English. So those are some of the instances of the work we did regarding deep fake during the last election. And we also did like a workshop and I feel like I can speak more to some of those things later in the course of the discussion. Thanks so much, Hannah. I think we cannot um, overemphasize the need for media literacy, digital literacy. The previous panels really grounded the fact that the use of artificial intelligence is not new, um, even though it has really bubbled up to the surface now, and it's really in virtually every conversation. But when we think of algorithms that recommend um, content to us, that is artificial intelligence. Moderation on tech platform, the technology that facilitates that is artificial intelligence. And I really would want to come to you, Adi Jumwa. We can't talk about this without talking about transparency and tech transparency for the platforms or within the platforms. How transparent are platforms about their algorithms and content moderation processes? Thank you, and thanks to CDID as well. I think um, this question even actually came up while we were just listening to the other panels. And, yeah. You know, in the end, it's all about how transparent these platforms are. And key question I asked someone earlier on, listening to instances where you could generate an article with, um, with, with AI, right? Okay, thank you. The key question I asked someone earlier on, when we were talking about, you know, you could generate an article with AI and, and then you publish it. And I asked that question from my perspective as a journalist. So how do I know? the difference between a copy that is generated by AI and a copy that is written originally by the journalist. And it leads us to the question of, again, transparency on our part as journalists and as, on our part as media organizations or as editors. Are you going to be able to disclose to your audiences the extent to which AI was used you know, in generating that particular content? What kind of support you got from AI? So the audiences know when they're reading that content, they know exactly to what extent this content was aided by, or the production was aided by AI, and to what extent did we have, you know, input from the journalists or from the organization in, on, on that particular output. Then if you take that to platforms, you know, so platforms that, in, that enable us to be able to play in the global digital media space, how transparent are they as well in terms of, you know, letting the audiences understand what it is that they allow them to see and what it is that they don't allow them to see per time. How do their algorithms function? And how does this algorithm determine what you see and what you don't see? Um, I, to, to, to the large extent, platforms have not been as transparent as they ought to be in, in, in that respect. And there have been attempts to get them to, to that level of transparency in different parts of the world. Um, in Europe, we've been citing the laws on AI that, that the EU passed. Uh, the EU also had a DSA, a Digital Service Act in, in 2022, yeah. that also focused on what you know, digital platforms are supposed to do in terms of transparency. The need to have a standard audit, for instance. The need to, to be um, transparent in terms of letting users know what it is that determines when the content is redacted, when the content is reduced, when the content is removed, and why, under what circumstances would your content be removed. Uh, being able to easily flag, you know, uh, fake 
fake news or fake content on those platforms and also exposing users to you know processes that they could take to be able to also flag something that they consider to be inappropriate or consider to be fake i think a lot of it is still a lot of work in progress even in places where there are deliberate efforts to you know you know look into these things and create laws like i mentioned in the case of the eu or even in the us uh, down here in, in, in Nigeria, by extension, uh, on our continent, I'm not sure we're doing a lot in that area yet. And, and so there's a lot of gap in that respect. And I would hope that we're not just sitting back and waiting to adopt laws and processes uh, that might have been put in place in, in Europe or in America and just simply say, okay, yeah, that's what we do. But sometimes we don't even say that's what we do. We just adopt it without even saying anything. So we need to be more deliberate this time around, seize the narrative, and, and be in the driver's seat of determining what measure of transparency we want from these platforms when they operate in our own environment. Oh, thanks so much. And, I, and you've touched on very key points. You've touched on regulation and what that should look like and how we shouldn't just wait and adopt what's happening in other climes. Because we've seen in many instances where that adoption has really led, led to very harmful consequences for us. Because their situation, their context is very different from what's obtainable here. So it's really a call to action for all of us to get involved. And where there are conversations around tech actions, around policy formulation around regulation, the civil society really has to be vibrant. And it really would come from conversations like this. And also really um, getting knowledge, you know, and trying to soak in as much information as possible. Um, and you also talked about transparency from within the media space as well. Um, how much do we disclose of the use of AI within our processes? And I think one key question is, does AI have a place in every aspect of news production? Or should it have a place in every aspect of news production? And how do we disclose that? And that's going to lead me to you, Monsoor. Um, you touched on this earlier about how you identify the news sources that your tools rely on. I want you to walk us through the methodology, your ranking methodology that led you to de-emphasize some news sources and elevate or promote other news sources? Okay. All right, so um, I think before the question, you made a mention of um, you know, should, how much AI should have to do in the news production. And to keep it short, I think it should be humans first and humans last. Whatever happens in between, is, I think it's, it's acceptable. But then humans first and humans last. So now on the question of um, how we rate our, um, our sources. So we have the fact check um, organizations who are our partners. And basically, we trust the work that these fact checkers do. We trust the work that they do. If I see something from Dubawa, we trust the work that they do. It's the reliability there. That is essentially what they have to do. They are fact checks. So now, when it comes to, it depends on the question. So when, it come, when, it, the, when the question has been answered by one of the fact checking organizations, then it picks the response from them. However, if it's not been fact checked by any of these um, top organizations, then it's going to let you know that we do not have data that, um, that is enough evidence to show that this thing is true or false. But then it can then provide you with other relevant sources. So now you get to make the choice. So we are building it in a, with the concept of explainable AI. That is, it is giving you explanations as to why it cannot answer something. So that is the whole methodology behind that. I really like that. I really like the fact that there is disclosure on where, when there is a knowledge gap. Yes. And also putting the users in the driver's seat so they can also make a determination by themselves. Um, I'm going to come to you, Silas. Thank you so much, Monsoor, for that. I'll come to you, Silas. Um, I really want you to share a little bit more about, and this is a, a question with two parts, so it's another loaded question. Um, I really want you to share with us what, the unique, what are the unique challenges 
that actually before that, what are the contributions, what contributions are Nigeria and Africa making towards the development of indigenous softwares to combat deep fakes? We've seen demonstrations today. Um, I don't think any of the demonstrations touched specifically on combating deep, deep fakes, but I really would want you to touch on that. And then also share with us what the challenges are. Well, thank you very much. Uh, deep fakes have two categories. There's visual deep fakes and there's audio-based deep fakes. Uh, uh, in the past three years, efforts have been put so much on visual deep fakes. You know, the moderator was speaking how he was nearly impersonated, you know. Uh, perhaps you could have used the opportunity to get more opportunities. <laughs> but th that tells you the extent of how people get to believe what they see. And that is one challenge, that people want to believe what they want to believe, mostly because of confirmation bias. So if someone uh, produces a deep fake that has... Um, uh, the, the, that the seems to uphold someone they, they like, they don't even want to question it, you know? Sometimes the gaps are, are staring you glaringly like this, or maybe the facial expression of the person is unnatural, or, 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 or maybe there's some things that just doesn't add up, but people do not want to look carefully because of confirmation bias, which is one of the challenges that we have, because people just want to share it forward and say, hey, look at, look at this. I've been telling you this person is this, but you don't want to believe me. Now take a look. I could give you an example. Um, uh, uh, during the election, there was uh, an audio deep fake uh, that, that came on, not the one that pertains to Peter Obi particularly. There was another one that has to do with, uh, I think, a conversation between Atiku and his deputy. You know, uh, that was a deep fake categorically because when we looked at the audio, we saw that it was, it was um, a combination of snippets of what he said somewhere here, here, and here, and it was compiled into a longer speech using AI. So, mm -hmm. but it was a problem because people wanted to hear something like that from him so they could justify certain beliefs. And another challenge of, of uh, responding to, to, to deep fake issues in Africa is that most of the tools that we are using to verify AI visuals or, or AI um, uh, images that are generated as deep fakes, uh, actually the model they build usually have uh, white faces. You know, so when you when there is a black face and you're trying to upload it there, it doesn't just give you anything. So there's a tool, Hugging Face. Uh, it is usually uh, we we use it to to verify deep fakes. And when I tried it, sometime I I tried black faces, nothing comes up. And then I reached out to the person and he said, Oh yeah, that's a big gap. Can I come up with uh, lots of models of black faces? And then I started putting up pictures and all of that, so the tool could be more uh, uh, reliable. And so you see that one of the things is there isn't a lot of uh, contextual understanding of the African context in order to build tools that would answer the problem. That is in terms of challenges. But how far have we come? How far have we come? Like I said, to verify when something is deep fake, it is not a blue-black thing to say, hey, this is true, this is false. Because there's a lot of uh, nuances uh, surrounding it. Uh, so for example, you wouldn't just want to upload the audio and, and then you upload it to a tool and then it tells you this is deep fake, this is not. There are tools like that. Uh, but at GIJN, uh, the Global Investigative uh, Journalism Network, we're partnering with them. Uh, we're working on a tool, especially for audio deep fakes, that doesn't just tell you this is uh, true or false. It does uh, an acoustic analysis of the person's voice and show you um, uh, gaps and problems, why this sh is a deep fake. And then also uh, there is um, uh, uh, another new tool that is encompassing uh, African context, African language, African context, African faces, AI or not, they, they're doing a good job here and they're incorporating the, uh, uh, the African community and putting it uh, in their model. So it is not, um, it is, I can't, I can't, uh, boldly say, hey, this is uh, uh, what we have at the moment, but really Africa is playing catch up, but uh, this is where we are at now and uh, what we are trying to build. So, so that's it. Thank you. Yes, indeed, we're playing catch up, but that also presents tremendous opportunities for, for us to leverage. So um, it is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. 
for us to partner with tech developers, particularly indigenous tech developers, because they understand the context, so they can prefer African solutions to Africans. Um, I'm going to come to you now, Hannah, and I'm, I'm, I'm asking you these questions because I know that you have worked on, you have monitored closely um, transitions, democratic transitions in Nigeria. And I would want, I, I would really would want to hear your perspective on how deep fakes and disinformation have affected recent democratic transitions in Nigeria. Okay, yes, yeah, so, you know, talking about the impacts of deep fake and the impact on election and democratic transition, of course, we know that the aim of disinformation is to deceive and to distort public opinion, so which is like one glaring effect, the fact that you divide the opinion of people, you are trying to influence the opinion of people by producing deep fake. And if we look at our own society where people, the literacy level is low, and even the digital literacy level is low. So people are quick to believe, quick to believe like easy manipulated media or synthetic media. It's much more, the effect is much more pronounced in our own society. And one other thing that I will say about how disinformation is affecting recent democratic transition in, especially in our own society, is to look at this thing called the liar's dividend, where people would do things, they, even when you have video evidence, and they'll come out to say, oh, no, that is not correct. It was manipulated by, you know, it was, it's a manipulated image. It was created by AI. I'm sure we've had examples of that with some former state governor caught in a corruption bribery video. And so people would even deny factual evidence. And again, it's all boiled down to the issue of declining media trust. Yeah. It's happening in the Western countries where there's a lot of polarization and people don't even believe like the media institution. It's also trickling down in our society where people would easily say, oh, you can't trust the media. And that would leave great room for people with propaganda to be able to push their agenda. And we'll also say that one other thing is, you know, this, the issue of deep fake and disinformation is that it's also fueling like a disinformation for IR industry in Nigeria. We've seen that in India where you have a lot of software companies coming up, even in the US and they are producing AI that people can easily use to clone voices of politicians, you know, to deceive people. That is also something that would be happening in Nigeria where young people can easily, or should I say digitally, tech savvy people are recruited to create some of these images by politician and by politicians and just image just fake videos are shared on social media to manipulate public opinion. And the effect would be that exercising civic duty would be limited because now people are confused. They are not able to get the actionable information that they need to make informed decision, not just only to vote during election, but also to hold government accountable. So these are some of the instances of how deep fake is affecting democratic transition and not just only in nigeria we've seen it in other african countries as well i i was i saw a deep fake video recently about the president of zambia so it's something that is quite picking up around the continent yes indeed um i i think the liar's dividend is one thing is one issue that there are a number of use case scenarios that we can point to where Actual mm -hmm. videos, sometimes we're seeing the videos, we're seeing the pictures, and we know this to be true. And um, the next day what we see is that, oh no, it's a deep fake, that was not me. Or something was posted and we hear my account was hacked. Right, so that's um, very, very common. And it's also what it does to the information integrity during sensitive periods like elections. It really creates this, uh, a climate of confusion where people do not know what to believe. And you can see how that directly impacts on the election outcome. 
and integrity of the election outcome. And I would want to come to you now, Ade Jumwa, um, and, and I think this will be more of like an education session that you would have for us. Um, what kind of reporting mechanisms do platforms have in place to inform users about the action taken against disinformation and harmful content? And um, what do you think are the limitations of those mechanisms? Again, it, it, um, we can't overemphasize the need for the environment to be governed by certain rules, right? Um, so when we talk about mechanisms for reporting um, fake, 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 fake news on these platforms, for instance, a lot of it have been driven by legislations put in place in certain parts of the world, and which, like we said earlier on, has been almost totally absent here. Uh, apart from the, the one that we have that we're using to more or less sometimes even twist to, to chase around journalists nowadays and, and more or less clamp, clamp, clamp down on freedom of information and expression rather than use it to clamp down on, 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 on fake news. But if you speak generally in terms of what's happening on platforms around, around, around the world, it takes you back again to the EU. The EU has done a lot of work in that respect, and I think everybody's kind of copying what they've done especially with the Digital Services um, Act that they passed in 2022. Now that law provides that hosting services and platforms, including on, on these online platforms, must now have an express legal obligation to provide clear and specific statements of reasons for content moderation. They must provide clear and specific statements for what has happened to a particular content and why it needs to be pulled. They must also provide platforms Easy, easily accessible platforms for users to be able to report what they found to be um, um, to be fake or to be illegal or to be uh, un unsubstantiated or unwholesome on, on the platforms that they've, they've used. Um, there have also been clear regulations around when you pull down a content or when you restrict a content, you must explain why that's been done. Also provide room for out of court settlement procedures where the person who has posted that content, if they feel aggrieved that you pull down their content or they believe that you are infringing on their right. Because you see, there's a delicate balance between content moderation and human rights. Um, so people believe that they have a right to freedom of expression and that these platforms haven't positioned themselves as places for public discourse, global public discourse in the digital space that it should be a level playing ground for everyone to be able to express themselves. And when I have said something and you've decided to either restrict what I have said or actually totally pull it out or yank it off, I might feel slighted. I might even feel that you're infringing on my right of, of freedom of expression. So there has to be procedures and mechanisms for me to be able to report that or for me to be able to engage you as a platform owner and be able to say, look, I think you've, you've done the wrong thing here. I think this should be allowed. And there's those kind of provisions in the law for out of court um, settlement kind of procedure for, for, for platform users to be able to engage platform owners and talk about those kind of situations when they, when they arise. Just suppose that's what is happening here. I think what we're doing is we're copying all of that. We're just moving along. I am not aware, for instance, if we have a platform where I could report to, for instance, as a Nigerian, if my content had been pulled down by Facebook. And I've had instances where, I mean, as a journalist now who operates here and elsewhere, I've had instances where colleagues here are asking us for contacts. Oh, who can I talk to in Meta? Who can I talk to, you know, because something has happened to their content. And, and these, are, these are journalists who've been around for years. Sometimes they're actually confused about what to do when their content has been you know, restricted or yanked up, and they think it's been done unfairly. So a lot still needs to be done in terms of, you know, educating people about where to go and what to do. A lot needs to be done by platform owners in terms of making those processes visible, easily accessible for everyone who comes on, on those platforms to use them. Yeah, absolutely. A lot needs to be done. I, for, for many people, including journalists and human rights defenders and activists, Social media is a living archive for them. 
It's a way in which they can store critical pieces of evidence. And, and, and sometimes these are evidence that could be used in several judicial mechanisms or accountability efforts. So when they are taken down, it feels like it's lost forever. And so there's a lot of conversation that needs to happen there. And thanks for shedding light on it. I know we are the session between you and your lunch, and we wouldn't want to keep you any longer. However, um, now that you have this set of intelligent, brilliant, passionate experts here, we want to give three minutes to questions or comments from the house, and we would respond and wrap up. There's a hand here. Do we want to take the microphone? Or would you want to project? <laughs> like 40 million number of viewers and they are giving airtime to people making claims in Nigeria that are not verifiable have not been fact checked uh, just day before yesterday I was on it and somebody is giving airtime 5, 10, 20 minutes come to me this is my number I cure HIV AIDS they have not been fact-checked. They are also online. Check them on Instagram. Uh, check them on TikTok. Check them on Facebook. I will say not only that, uh, they are also into selling of emotional drugs. But they color them with religion or I prefer emotion. I will give one example because I published an article and I'm happy NDLEA has picked it. There is this, they call it a kurkura, that it cures everything. And people, it is so cheap, as of two years ago, that with 20 naira, they will pour it on a cup. And it is dangerous because you see first-time users crawling, vomiting. But they go back, it's so addictive. And when I published, NDA called me, they did investigation. What did they find? High concentration of cannabis and tina for using paint. And I'm saying, but I'm seeing the fact check now is more biased towards politics. And now I can tell you on satellite television, free to air, there are more than six television stations that every hour they give at least 10 minutes to such people. So what are we going to do to fact check and debunk such issues? If we are talking of the social media, there is the one I'm Currently gathering data, uh, she has more than 2 million followers. And she's always using the bandwagon effect. She will chat with a customer, and then she will say, this is the impact of what I am selling. And you see people going. So the fact check, I think, particularly now that we are not into much politics, let it have a, like a roundabout towards other social problems across Nigeria. And I don't know whether they can pick the challenge here and see what can be done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We can take one more question and then we would wrap up. Okay. So I'll come back to you, the panelists. If there's anyone who wants to respond to that, um, and then we take less than a minute to wrap up. And I would want your wrap up to be a call to action. What is the call to action that you have to give to this room and to those who are watching and that we can take forward after this session? So I'll start with you, Silas. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, Dr. Hashim is my, was my lecturer in ABU, so you could imagine uh, me trying to answer my lecturer. It's, it's a privilege, actually. <laughs> But it's a good question that you have asked, uh, 
And while you were asking, I, I just kept ruminating in my head because I, I've, I've done core fact checking for, for, for many years now. And although I could not entirely deny the statement that there is some attention to politics, there has been a lot of work also in, in, um, in other issues such as health. Let me give you an example. Last year, we, uh, my colleague and editor, Mr. Kembi Busari, published a, a fact check on Baba Isha. You know, Baba Isha is a very common drug in, 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 uh, in uh, the North that promises to heal almost everything. You know, and I, I, we went round to places where they are selling these medicines, and I, I think that that investigation cost almost uh, five million, I would think, to conduct, uh, including uh, lab tests and other things. But when, the, when, when the, the investigation came out, just as yours came, uh, we there was a lot of discussions about it, NDA, uh, uh, NAFDAQ, all of that. But it just, you know, I think the, the person was even arraigned by the police. But after a month, everything went back to normal. We went to some of these locations. They were still selling the medicine, and people were uh, buying it. I remember in school, you, you, you told us about a theory, fear motivation theory, where people with health issues are, are motivated to get solutions because of the fear they have. Why, why fact-checking in other issues, such as health, doesn't have as much impact as in other areas is because people just want answers. They just want to get away from their pain and they don't even have the money to afford other things. So there's a lot of work there. It is just that it doesn't, I mean, I remember in ABU in 2014, I took salt and water, you know, because I don't want Ebola, you know. And, and when COVID came, I still took away to when I had that it was curing um, uh, COVID-19, you know. I hope it did anyway. Yes. So you could see that even I, who, who I, 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 I was scared. So in that regard, there is. And why there is so much attention on, on, um, on political uh, activities? Because we, one of the core pillars of fact-checking is accountability. You know, we want to hold people accountable to, to what they say. And most times in Africa, people that are accountable to us are those in power and those in power in politics. So that's why. But lastly, some of these TV stations that you've made, you've also taught me profit maximization in the media. They need to make money, you know, and, and that is the only, uh, if they have to give airtime to Tom, Dick, and plus Harry, why not if, the, if they, ha they can, you know, uh, 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 fund their, their media outfit. But it is true, your statement is, is highly valid, but these are just some of the challenges and nuances in the entire ecosystem of fact-checking. And in, in my takeaway, just to, to round up on that, uh, my takeaway is that one of the fear that we are looking at that has to do with deepfake is not even about uh, fake video or fake images. It is about people now pointing at deepfake to run away from their responsibilities. So someone would share something and say, hey, it's not me, it's, it's deepfake. It is, it is the video you saw is AI generated. So how that is, that is the future and that is what we're looking at so that we could not, we would not just say this is yes or no. We can even verify with the fact that this is how this video was created. So that when we present the fact, the person involved cannot say or deny that this is deep fake. So that's it. Thank you very much. Monsu. Okay, so I think Silas has done justice to that. Um, there's a lot of context behind it. But then um, I, I think one other thing that needs to be done is that we are addressing misinformation via the sources where it was propagated initially. So for Baba Aisha, for example, if, if the large audience of people who take this, if they listen to radio a lot, then we need to make like a lot of efforts, you know, propagating the fact check via the radio. If it's on WhatsApp, let us fight it on WhatsApp. If it's on Twitter, let us fight it on Twitter. But let us ensure that we are getting to the audience that would have been affected by this misinformation. And I think that's what we are trying to do at the CJID, um, you know, via our WhatsApp chatbot, uh, via supporting chat B, for example, on fighting misinformation on Twitter as well. So we, we understand this um, issue and, you know, we are making efforts to resolve it. Thank you. Thank you. Adejo. Right, I think my, my take right, will be one, and that one will address what he raised, it's a question, and what everybody else has said. And this rests on just one statement. 
we need to be organized as the media, and we need to take ownership and provide the right infrastructure, the right environment for all of these activities to work in a way that they serve the purpose of the greater good for the greater number of members of the society. If I break that down, the issues he is raised, I think as, as you know, clearly in the purview of the NBC. That's why the NBC exists. Media organizations, especially broadcast media organizations, are not allowed, in fact, no media organizations are allowed to broadcast or publish such blatant fake news or fake claims. Somebody standing up to say, I have a cure for HIV. That is clear, you say that on TV, I mean, it's clear, it's a clear violation of the code, right? And that's something that the NBC should have dealt with if we, if we had a proper uh, regulatory environment. Yeah. And when you come to all the great work that you know, my colleagues have spoken about in terms of fact checking, checking uh, you know, tools for checking uh, deep fakes, whether they're audio or visual and all of that, you've seen that they've spoken about these great efforts. But they've also identified a challenge in, in, I'll call it in terms of reverse engineering, right? So they've done all of this to check the fake things out there. The bad guys too, can do things to create confusion. So you put out a video about me that I don't like, and I want to blame it on, 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 on deep fake. All I need to do is create a deep fake video of myself in another circumstance, and then use that to create confusion. I say, well, they've done it before. They did this to me at one time, and now I believe this other one is also the work of my detractors. In other words, there's, there's confusion already. But this is all possible because we don't have a strong regulatory environment that is going to then look at what everyone else is doing, right? Both the ones who are doing it for the right purposes and the ones who are likely to do it for the wrong purposes. Once you leave the door open, anyone can come in and, and pollute the system and create confusion and, and create crisis. So we need, as a, as, a, as, as a group, as journalists, as technology enthusiasts, as people who are active in the civil society environment or eco space, we need to come together Take the bull by the horn, take the lead, take the driver's seat in this whole discussion of what AI could do and what digital platforms could do, and take the lead in providing the regulatory environment in which we want this to work in our own environment. That kind of place where the context of our environment, our languages, our culture, everything about us is taken into consideration in defining the rules of engagement. So much. And I'll come to you, Hannah, and you'll have the last word. Okay, thank you so much, Nkem. So I would like to make my call to action on three quick points, and it's addressed and directed at the media. You know, Anita said during one of the previous panel that we need to go beyond setting agenda. And again, we need to know that news reporting in this present age is not about the news bleeding for it to lead. So the point is, AI literacy for journalists is very, very important. And it's not only for journalists that are working in print or, I mean, in digital plat digital media, like say Premium Times or the Cable and the rest, even for print and even for broadcast, because you need to know, you need to be aware for you to be able to debunk that disinformation. And it should not be like a mainstream subject for fact checkers or those who are researchers. AI literacy is very, very important. So that is something the media needs to do more for journalists so that we can better inform and engage our audience. And the other point that I would like to note is collaboration. We have the, during the last election, we have the Nigerian Fact Checkers Coalition. How are we preparing to collaborate? towards the next election and I'm sure we'll have like loads and loads of examples of deep fake because the people who are pre producing this technology they are learning from India they are seeing the instances of what is happening currently in the US so let's prepare for collaboration so that we can even attract support from producers of this technology you can see the amount of money that open AI and my, my Microsoft they are investing on debunking disinformation in the Indian election and in the US election. Are we positioning ourselves to be able to attract that kind of support? Are we speaking with one voice? So collaboration is important. 
And the last point that I would like to mention is that we need to be very, very deliberate about reaching critical audiences. And by critical audiences, I mean young audiences and also people that are underserved, the older, the older people that are underserved by mainstream media platforms. We've seen a lot of wonderful tools that were launched during this, this conference. What is the plan to ensure that these tools get to the hands of people, the people who really need them, not just people within the journalism circle and people in the civil society. So those are some of the things that I would like us to be deliberate about. And like I said, it's addressed to the media and the preparation for the next election needs to start now. We should not wait. Thank you. Thank you so much. And my call to action would be on three words, and that would be sensible regulation, detection equity, and the need for collaboration. Thank you so much for listening. Fantastic one there. Sensible regulation. Detection equity. Right. And collaboration. Those are words to hold to heart. Once again, let's put our hands together for our panel. I mean, they did a yeoman's job under one hour, and I imagine it was a tough job condensing all of that under one hour. It's time for photographs now.